Good afternoon everyone, this is Steve from Stormy Sky Rail Productions. With us we have Mike Slater from the Western Union Junction Railroad Museum in Sturvent, Wisconsin. And Mike would like to tell us about his great equipment here and signals and everything else he has and his museum way out here. So Hi. go ahead Mike. Hi Steve and, and fans of the Stormy Sky uh, group here. Uh, we're standing in front of a Milwaukee Road caboose that was built in 1956 by the Thrall Car Company in Chicago Heights, Illinois for the Milwaukee Road. Train on. <laughs> Awesome, a bonus train. Yep. Okay, Mike, we can continue now. Okay. Um, the, uh, of course, the rail line that's across the street with the Amtrak train you just saw is on the former Milwaukee Road uh, C&M sub, which is, uh, was later acquired by the Sioux Line and now owned by the Canadian Pacific Railroad. Of course, Amtrak has trackage rights over the railroad. And usually if you come out here on a Sunday afternoon when we're open, uh, the early afternoon usually is a very busy period of time to watch trains and they also come over here and check out our museum. Uh, museum uh, was put in place in approximately 1992 by a group of volunteers. Uh, the caboose was purchased uh, from donations from local citizens and also local businesses here in the village uh, and has been open uh, yearly ever since the uh, caboose has been placed. Uh, which is a yearly with an asterisk. Uh, the uh, one year in 2020, we didn't open up the museum at all to the general public and that. But uh, every year we've been open to the public, uh, usually on on Sundays. Uh, currently, it's the first and third Sundays of the month. Uh, check our Facebook page with the link below the video to find out when we open up for the season and when we close. Uh, even though I do have a sign that says first and third. Uh, uh, May through September, depending on the weather, I may open early, may keep it open later in that. But uh, so keep an eye on our Facebook page. As far as some of the other displays we have out here, we have a switch stand display, we have a signal display, we have a uh, motor car display, which are all viewable from the outside of the caboose when we're not open. Uh, but we do have also interior displays of railroad artifacts uh, from both the Milwaukee Road and other southeastern Wisconsin railroads. Okay. Uh, our switch stand display here has many different uh, styles and shapes of switch stands uh, that are used on all kinds of different railroads. I don't know every uh, switch stand that came where it came from, but I do know a few in that. Uh, this one here came off the Chicago and Alton uh, down uh, in Illinois, uh, central Illinois. Uh, was, uh, the gentleman that gave us to us, he actually worked for the railroad and his house, uh, the driveway for his house is actually on the old railroad right away in that. But that was a nice little addition to our display. Of course the Milwaukee Railroad had the famous feather pattern. There were a few other railroads that had the feather uh, besides the Milwaukee Road, but uh, Milwaukee Road was one of them of course. The Milwaukee Road had their famed passenger trains of the Hiawathas and had the Native American motif in that. The smaller little stop sign here were somewhat famous on the Chicago Northwestern Railroad um, for their their targets and that. And I know there's a few of them. I like. I believe uh, this one here came off of Jones Island in in uh, Milwaukee and that. So that would have been both used, probably switched by Milwaukee Road, Chicago Northwestern, Grand Trunk, and uh, some of the railroads that, that switched down on Jones Island. Uh, as far as we have a lot of different trackside signals in that. Uh, I, again, don't recall all of them where they all came, but the two light signal uh, that's shown up above there, that actually came from Burlington, Wisconsin, that protected the diamond uh, with the Sioux line off the Milwaukee Road. And the diamond, uh, one of the reasons why we had the diamond in our little track work display here is the name of our museum, the Western Union Junction. The junction meaning a junction between two different rail lines and originally across the road by 
right next to the railroad hotel and where the depot used to stand, uh, there was a, a diamond or a junction between the Western Union Railroad and what later became the uh, the Milwaukee Road. Of course, the Milwaukee Road bought the Western Union Junction Railroad, and that line originally went all the way from Racine all the way to Savannah, Illinois, and eventually later on went out to Kansas City, Missouri uh, with the rail line. There we have it, another train. <laughs> we also have a small little signal display here at the museum. Of course, uh, the semaphore signal is one of the train order signals that used to be out in front of the old Sturdivant Depot. Uh, that was donated to us by a former Milwaukee Road employee that was also a member of our organization by the name of Bob Brown. Uh, he actually at one time owned, owned both of the train order semaphores. Uh, one of them is here, the other one is out towards Kansasville and stood in front of a business in there. Uh, the uh, different uh, signals, like we have a railroad crossing flasher that came off the old Sioux Line Railroad and that was given to us by another member that was a retired signal maintainer off the Wisconsin Central Sioux Line trackage. Uh, kind of hidden behind the motor car, there was another crossing gate uh, uh, signal that came from Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. But all the signals uh, basically came from the southeastern Wisconsin area and at uh, in this little display of signals. Uh, the, we also have a track full of different motor cars in at. Uh, this very first one here is an M M19 model from, made by the Fairmont Motor Company out of Fairmont, Minnesota. Uh, this one originally saw service on the Grand Trunk Railroad in Michigan. Uh, right behind it, we have an MT. 14 uh, that came off the Milwaukee Road and behind it the next four pieces of work equipment the crane and the two flat cars also uh, are off the Milwaukee Road and probably seen service on the CNM sub and maybe even the Southwestern Division that's kind of behind us uh, uh, curving along the edge of our museum property here and then also behind we do have a couple other motor cars uh, one of them down here is kind of interesting a flat car but it has a brake lever on it. This actually came from one of the the military uh, uh, military bases and from what we were told when we were given to us why there's a lot of different weld marks on here is because it uh, had different uh, brackets in it that used to carry ammunitions around the military bases. Uh, so then the reason for the brake lever of course was if you have live ammunition on being transported around the military base, you need to be able to make sure you stop the equipment safely. Another piece that came off of a military base, uh, kind of hidden behind the tree branches here, is this motor car, which probably pulled that, that uh, ammunition carrying car, but that actually has a Waukesha inline four cylinder gasoline engine and a Ford Model T transmission on it. Uh, really would love to see this one go, but it would take a lot of work to get it going. But um, uh, from what I've gathered, I believe that this might be a model that they called the Casey Jones model. Uh, very kind of hard to find and uh, rare in that. Also at our museum, we have three storage box cars. Uh, they're all 1961 uh, Pullman Standard built uh, box cars. Uh, the first one is a 40-foot box car, and this one we actually purchased from Canadian Pacific Railroad Sight Unseen. It was up in Canada, and all we knew it was a 40-foot box car, and we bought it for scrap value. And currently we're using it as storage. The uh, next two box cars were on site. Uh, the first one uh, the railroad had given up to us uh, for storage purposes. And then when the third box car was also on site and when the railroad no longer needed it for their uh, track gang and, and maintenance crews and that, they also gave us that box car for storage purposes. Uh, maybe if we get enough volunteers one day in, in that, uh, we can expand more museum display space in one of the box cars because we have a lot of artifacts in storage and display cases in storage to expand the museum if we can ever get the volunteers to do so. How about What's the signal here? Oh, the uh, uh, we have other signals also alongside the tracks here. Uh, the color position light 
it came off the Chicago and Alton Railroad. Uh, that one we were kind of lucky to obtain. Uh, a couple of our members at the time actually went down to uh, Springfield, Illinois area to photograph the color position lights before they got uh, uh, removed from the railroad and they were lucky enough to run into a signal maintainer and the signal maintainer said well come and see our supervisor we all were all meeting up after uh, our shift uh, they met up with the individual and the the, the, the foreman and that said follow, follow, us to, follow me to my house and I'll give you a signal head so uh, sometimes if you're at the right place and you talk to the right person uh, things can go the right right way for a group or a museum but you have to have those good contacts and have good common sense communication with the individuals uh, the other signal we have alongside the box cars is the uh, searchlight signal here uh, this one here came from uh, Sturdivant and it was actually off the south protected the, the southwestern division before you got to the Cena main line from the Y in Sturdivant when they took this out of service and that the uh, the railroad uh, gave this to us being it's a local signal to the, the village and the other signals we also have here are came off of the Wisconsin Central uh, Salem Road grade crossing in Kenosha County uh, again these were donated to us by the Wisconsin Central and our uh, Dwayne Johnson, which was a member of our group in that, uh, former retired signal maintainer off the WC. He got these uh, signals actually donated to us by Ed Burkhart, and uh, the signals have a marker on it for uh, that they were given to us by Ed Burkhart and the WC. Uh, another little interesting artifact right now that I have outside on display is probably one of our oldest pieces of artifacts we have which is the Lincoln pin coupler pocket um, these were outlawed on the railways in the 1890s for interchange service uh, some lasted and and on the railroads for in company use only but uh, these were outlawed because uh, a lot of railroad employees lost limbs uh, while switching cars a very dangerous a uh, piece of equipment on a rail car. Of course, this is the uh, the wigwag signal that I mentioned that was given to us by the WC and Ed Burkhart. Um, I believe this one here was when they initially put the grade crossing in with the wigwags. It only had one wigwag signal. Uh, the second wigwag signal was added to the other side of the grade crossing a few years later. This one here, I believe, is the old, uh, the newer of the two wigwag signals. The one on the other side of the caboose is actually the older one. You know, now let's go inside our Milwaukee Road caboose and take a look inside what we have on display. Uh, welcome inside the caboose. Uh, we have a lot of different artifacts on display. Uh, almost everything that's inside the caboose here is no longer used on the railroads uh, due to things uh, being improved, upgraded, or uh, found that, you know, there's better techniques of doing things in it. Uh, one of the first things you'll notice when you walk inside the caboose is our showcase with communication items uh, on the railroad, all the way from the telegraphy key uh, with the Prince Albert uh, can uh, sitting. Technically, the, the Prince Albert can should actually be in the resonating box. And the reason for the Prince Albert can, we were told by a former railroad telegrapher, was that as a train went by, uh, you would have a hard time hearing the clicks, so they would put an empty tin can behind the, the clicker in the resonating box and it would actually make the clicks louder so they could hear it while the trains were going by. So after he told us, you know, asked us where our Prince Albert can was and told us why, we had to go to a local antique store and buy a Prince Albert can. Uh, so that one of the interesting facts. Of course, the, the old accordion telephone that was used in the depots for their inner office phone system. Uh, of course, the the railroads used a party line system so if you were at one depot you could and two other depots were communicating you could pick up the line and hear the communication going on between the depots and usually a way that the railroads would uh, let which depot know to pick up the telephone if they needed to talk to somebody was by a ring system of, of the phone 
depending on the number of rings, either long rings or short, quick little rings, that would designate which depot it needed to pick up the phones. Some of these terms are still used on the railroads today. Uh, one of the more uh, recognizable one in the southeastern Wisconsin is a point on the railroad called Five Rings uh, in, uh, by up in the yards, Milwaukee Road yards in Milwaukee. And that was a tower uh, and it was five rings on the phone to let the tower operator know that he needed to pick up the phone to communicate with whoever was trying to get a hold of him. Uh, also in the showcase on the upper shelf is the ticket stamper that came out of the Sturdivant Depot. Uh, again, that was given to us by Bob Brown, a former Milwaukee Road employee. Uh, some of the other artifacts we have on the wall are, is the train order hoop. And here we have a photograph of uh, uh, Bob Brown when he was working on the railroad, hooping up orders to uh, the train crew. Uh, there are two common uh, train order. One is the hoop, and the other one is a fork, which is kind of a Y shape. And they would have a string tied in between the, uh, the fork while with the hoop they had a little spring clip that they would put the train orders on and the train crews would uh, try to get their arms through the train order hoop and snatch it from the person on the ground as soon as the train crew would get their orders then they would fling the, the uh, train order hoop back to the ground uh, i was told by a railroader the smart depot agents and tower operators usually would have a dog with them that was trained to fetch the train order hoop so he didn't have to walk and get the <laughs> train order hoops in it. Uh, also on display on the other side of the display case we have uh, four photographs currently of this very caboose. Uh, the one that uh, is being shown to you right now is uh, the last photo that we have of an, an active service on the railroad and that's when it was uh, Milwaukee Road was purchased by the Sioux Line Railroad and it was renumbered to 179 and as Jenny's uh, scrolling over uh, we have the uh, different various photographs in the late 70s and uh, finally the last photograph will be uh, what I'm suspecting to be the late 1960s going through Sturdivant, Wisconsin and the caboose also has its original caboose number with two zeros in front of it instead of the 99 and the reason for the zero uh, originally it was it was designating as a non-revenue car and when the railroads got the computers the early computers would not recognize the zero as the first digit of the, and would drop it so in this case the 2186 also had a dozen, uh, same number as a diesel locomotive and that would have been a conflict between trying to figure out what was the caboose or what was the diesel locomotive so for non-revenue cars the Milwaukee Road added a 99 prefix to the car number instead of the zero and thus eliminating any errors in the early computers. Of course modern computers now you could have the first digit as a zero and it would recognize it actually as being a numerical value. Uh, also in the caboose here we have a locomotive control stand. The control stand was not inside of the caboose. Uh, this was donated to a gentleman or to us by a gentleman that used to live in Kenosha when he bought the control stand. He actually could have bought the whole cab of the locomotive for the price that he bought the control stand for. for. But unfortunately, he, he had a better judgment uh, and thought what his wife would have to say uh, when he, he bought the, uh, uh, if he would have brought the whole cab home. But uh, so the control stand came out of a Milwaukee Road U23B uh, locomotive, which Surprisingly, there was nothing wrong with the locomotive when the Milwaukee Road decided to scrap the locomotive. It ran into the scrapyard underneath its own power and was cut up for scrap. Of course, at that time, uh, the Milwaukee Road was in financial hardships. It was the early 1980s, and uh, the Milwaukee Road and a lot of other roads had a surplus of locomotives, and a lot of roads were cutting up equipment for scrap. Um, over on this side of the caboose opposite from the control stand is the, the desk and the chair. There was, another, there was another chair exactly like this where the control stand uh, sat. We currently have that removed to have the control stand on display. But this is the, the chair and the desk of the conductor of the train. Uh, the conductor was in charge of the train and told everybody what to do, including the engineer. He had his own little radio that he could communicate with the head end uh, locomotive. He had an emergency brake stand to put the train into emergency, and he also had an airline pressure gauge 
that uh, he could monitor what the, the brake line pressure was on the rear of the train. Uh, usually before they left the yard, the train crew would all communicate and the engineer would let the conductor know what he was going to be using for brake pressure because depending on the time of the year, being warm or cold, you had to regulate your brake line pressure and that the colder weather is the air would do different things so they would uh, adjust accordingly to the weather and, and weather conditions. Walking a little bit further down in the caboose we have another display case that has artifacts from the railroad passenger car service. The upper shelf has some items from the Pullman Car Company. Uh, not only did the Pullman Car Company build railway passenger cars and freight cars, they also operated the sleeping cars uh, in the United States on most all the railroads. There were a few exceptions. Uh, Milwaukee Road did handle their own sleeping car service. And on the lower shelf we have items from the passenger car service, including a model of the old Sturdivant Depot, but uh, most noting is the China with the California poppy motif, and that was from the famed Santa Fe Super Chief, and that was the train of the Hollywood starlets and uh, stars and all that, and who knows who used that China. Could have been some Holly famous Hollywood actor or actress. Uh, if you or I would probably rode the train out to California uh, from Chicago on the Santa Fe, we would have probably rode the El Capitan, uh, which was an all-coach seat, and that's uh, designated by that simple uh, blue rim china with SF on it. Uh, that was China from the El Capitan. Of course, the china that was in front of that with the blue rim, that was from Amtrak in the 1970s, 1980s time period. Uh, again, to kind of go with the Lincoln Pin Coupler Pocket, we also, also do have examples of the Lincoln Pins. And of course, one of the reasons why they were outlawed is as you would figure two cars backing up, uh, the switchman had to stand in between the cars, hold and guide the link that was all already secured in one coupler pocket, but had to guide it into the coupler pocket of the car that was backing up. And hopefully he would then in turn remove his hand in, in time before it got crushed. Uh, a lot of times when a railroader went from railroad to railroad, they would ask him to hold up his hand to see how many fingers he had and the more fingers he had they knew that he was a good railroader because he knew what he was doing uh, again um, equipment on the railroad you can't hurt it it will hurt you so always have that safety mindset when you're walking around the railroad and that uh, a couple other things that I had also up front here uh, was my uh, conductors uniforms uh, we have a couple on display currently, and we have a lot of other ones in storage. But two that I have on display is the Chicago Northwestern and the Dark Pullman Green. Uh, that was a color that the Northwestern used in their passenger equipment in the 30s, 40s, and 50s for their conductors. And then the other one that I have on display is the uh, 1970s era Amtrak uh, female conductors uniform with the silk blouse and the, the vest and all that, and even a, a sweater behind it. Uh, that all matches the 1970s color motif. Uh, a little bit of history about Sturdivant. Sturdivant isn't its original name. Uh, it's actually had many different names. It's kind of a community of almost an identity crisis, as some might say. Uh, as you noticed uh, my earlier introduction, the uh, we took our club's or group's name uh, from one of the original names of the village, which was uh, Western Union Junction. Uh, Western Union Junction, of course, like I mentioned earlier, was the crossing of two different rail lines. Uh, later, the community's name was changed to Corliss, Wisconsin, when the Brown Corliss Engine Works opened up a factory here in the village. Uh, that lasted until about the 1920s when after the Corliss Engine Works had closed down, the B.F. Sturdivant Corporation opened up a, uh, a, a facility in the old uh, Brown Corliss Engine Works plant. Uh, they lasted in the village for about three years before we're going out of business. And it's been Sturdivant ever since. Uh, about uh, five, six years ago, S.E. Johnson's Wax actually wanted the village to change their name to Waxdale, but with all the companies that we changed our name to in the past, uh, the village board said 
no, we're keeping it Sturt event. Uh, the last time we, we named uh, uh, our community after the local company that was in the area, uh, they went out of business and we like to keep the jobs here locally. But uh, uh, stop by, check our Facebook page. Um, and the other thing is, you know, we're a small little community type thing. We're always looking for volunteers. If you live in southeastern Wisconsin or northern Illinois and want to help out, uh, message us on, on our Facebook page. Uh, get in contact with us. If you don't live in the area and you have other uh, community, if you live in a community that has a railroad display in a village park, contact your local politicians to see if there's an organization that maintains the equipment and volunteer and help. Uh, all the local communities are always looking for help to upkeep the public displays. Uh, with that, uh, do you have any other questions that maybe I may have missed? Yeah, I wanted to go out on the platform there and just kind of shoot uh, where the old uh, section office was that I actually worked out of. Uh, before we moved across the street. I'd yep. um, like to just see that land. I do have pictures of that. I'll put in a slideshow in this video and, and uh, of how it was before that and now it's gone. So yeah, it's, actually, actually what was later became your section house was originally built as a freight house. And there used to be a platform that it stood on and used to have loading docks where boxcars could actually park up alongside it and they could unload less than carload freight traffic into the freight house and then a truck local from a local business could then come and get their shipments and loads i don't know when the railroad took it down to grant ground level and took the uh the raised platform off but uh years it stayed empty and then when uh the uh railroad uh was looking to uh move out of the depot because there was going to be a, a preservation group moving into it they moved all the track crews and all that to the old freight house and remodeled it. Okay, so. we'll, we'll stop by there uh, on our way. Uh, Mike explained what it was and I'll we'll take a short video clip of where it was in the parking lot when on our way out. But I thank you, Mike, so much for taking the time out with us and explaining what you have here on display. Make sure you check him out and when you're in town, out of town, coming in town, Please stop here and visit. It's a really cool place. And then you got this Canadian Pacific Railway right there. You can go track side for a while. Check out Amtrak Canadian Pacific. And please subscribe and like and leave a comment on our video. And uh, hopefully everybody enjoyed this. And this is Steve from Stormy Sky Rail Productions. Everybody have a nice day. Currently behind me we have the old freight house which was our section office until they vacated us out of this building and moved us across the street, which we'll take a clip of. This is where the, we have pictures of it. We'll put in a slideshow and the history of it. And But this is where it was right here. Spent a lot of time here, and now it's gone totally after vacating. We thought they were going to save it for a historical thing. I wish they kind of would have. But this is where the old section office and freight house used to be. Right on this concrete area here. So, thank you. As I previous mentioned, across the street was our old section headquarters uh, before they kind of kicked us out. And then they built this behind me. This is where the old Sturdivant Corliss Depot stood, right on this lot here which will be coming up on another video that will cross-reference. This is where I spent the last days of my railroad career <laughs> headquartering out of here in Sturdivant, Wisconsin when I was track inspector and now you know, I'm medically retired now. So I spent a lot of time in this building and I still run into people I worked with and say hi and, and talk. A lot you know because we work together so much and uh, so this is where I ended up my career at the Sturdivant section headquarters and the signal maintainers also and the welders were out of here so and this is Sturdivant Wisconsin